Hi, I'm Preet Bharara, and I was the U.S. attorney in Manhattan. But in March of this year, Donald Trump fired me. So what the hell do I do now? Podcast, baby. Preet Bharara is known as the sheriff of Albany and the watchdog of Wall Street. So let's get right to my first guest. Brilliant, hilarious, handsome. Please welcome Preet Bharara. It's Bharara. I said Baraha. Barrara. What? It's Barrara. I've always had a problem with that name. Let me ask you this. Is what's going on in the world right now normal? So I think depending on how you feel about institutions in America and what the precedent has been, mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think it's not normal. I think we've been deviating from the mean in so many different ways, mm, yeah. and I think it's important for the public to know that. I'm sorry? Were you insulted when the president fired you? A little bit. Do you miss subpoena power? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know, I have a question for you. Why a podcast? I'm doing a podcast because I care about justice, I care about fairness, I care about amplifying my voice. Uh, yeah, I couldn't get a TV show. I couldn't have said it better myself. And by the way, what's the name of this podcast? Stay tuned. Stay tuned for what? Stay tuned. But stay tuned for what? For the show. Stay tuned. Stay tuned with Preet. So I'm gonna go. Uh, good luck with the show. Good luck with the job hunt, okay? See ya, see you later. From CAFE, welcome to Stay Tuned. I'm Preet Bharara. Good evening. Welcome. Um, we have a full house. Here at the town hall, which kind of amazes me. Um, not only do we have about 1,500 people uh, in, the, in the room, there are 45,000 people outside who, who, who couldn't get in, whom I feel very very bad for, um, you all know that there's no singing or dancing, right? <laughs> it's like just two lawyers gonna be sitting here. <laughs> so, you know, we're very, Tubin and I are very flattered, but that's what the country has come to, that you're gonna, you pay money <laughs> to come out on a, on a Thursday night to listen to two lawyers. We'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, it's great to be at the town hall. Uh, our last show was at the Apollo, another storied institution. This place is equally storied, uh, built in 1921. Lots of amazing things have happened. The last time I was here, I sat somewhere over there and listened to Bruce Springsteen. You're clapping for yourself, that's very good. <laughs> you have a very healthy ego. Uh, I sat over there and listened to, to Bruce Springsteen be interviewed about his, his then new book. Um, and we had some homage to him. We were playing some Bruce, right? Is that all right? Uh, we have a great, great guest today, Jeffrey Tubin, and a great show that'll come up in a little bit. I want to uh, do some housekeeping things, acknowledge some people. Uh, there are a lot of I have a lot of friends in the audience, uh, former colleagues, some SDNY folks. Dan Stein should be somewhere here. There he is, my former criminal division chief. <laughs> Uh, Ann Milgram, who is a three-time guest on the podcast, if you listen, is here somewhere. Thank you, Ann. There are, there are even people uh, from high school came, came all the way from New Jersey to be here. If, where, are my, where are my high school people? <laughs> I was not very popular in high school. <laughs> 
and it was a very small high school. But, but, but my yearbook page is totally good. <laughs> you can ask them. Uh, I have some family here, as I often do. Um, some of my family is here. Um, all of them, obviously, as you might appreciate, uh, couldn't make it uh, because the caravan hasn't gotten here yet. <laughs> I mean, sure, why not? My Indian peeps like to hang out with the Middle Easterners in the caravan. Like, <laughs> why? Why wouldn't they? <clears throat> my wife is here. My son is here. My youngest son is here. Once again, who once again didn't have enough homework to get out of coming to hear two lawyers speak. Luckily, his ticket was half price. Um, my, my mother and father are here. They missed the last show. My brother, Vinny, and, uh, who is my boss, and his wife, Vina, are here. Um, I, have, I have one special message to a guest in the audience. I got a really nice email from somebody, and I don't ordinarily do this, and I'm not going to do it again. But let's all say happy birthday to Martha Billman. Martha. Martha. We received a lovely note uh, from her daughter, Hillary Trainer. Hillary and his and sister sent her parents sent their parents to this live show. I don't know what that says about them. <laughs> um, but congratulations to your husband, Brooks Billman, who I heard is also retiring from uh, my own place of employment, NYU Law School. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, so a lot has been going on in my life, not that you care, but you're a captive audience, and I will tell you. Uh, so I, I spent much of the last year, year and a half, uh, writing a book about justice, about how I think justice is done, how sometimes it's not done. And I tell a lot of stories in the book, and maybe in a, in a few months when it's on sale, we will have a bunch of them outside, and you will be required to buy them <laughs> if you want to come in and, and talk to us. Um, I understand that, that uh, although it seems early, uh, in the film version of the book, Paul Giamatti, <laughs> Paul Giamatti will be playing me, <laughs> so I can be deracialized even in my own book. <laughs> so, so you know, my guest tonight has written like 89 books. Apparently, he's he's written more books than I've I've read. So for him, it's easy. For me, it was actually it was very hard. You know, I'm immigrant, you know, difficult. And, <laughs> but in, in May, for those of you who really sort of follow my Twitter feed, you may know that I took a week uh, to get away from everyone, and I, and I, because I'm cheap, I went to the beach, but I didn't go to, you know, Europe uh, or the Riviera or to Miami or South Beach. I went to the lovely Jersey Shore. <laughs> and I... Um, and I spent a week on the, you know, along the surf in Long Branch. And I was busy, Long Branch, okay. It's like, it's like my four high school friends. Um, and, and I was busy writing the book and editing parts of the book. And so I actually forgot to shave, or as people may know, sometimes it's fun not to shave. And so I grew this thing, uh, apparently called a beard. It's um, not loved by everyone, liked by some people. The reason I'm telling you this is um, I was going to be on CNN, because I'm a legal analyst on CNN, from time to time, and my parents, who are in the audience, uh, love to watch anything I happen to say on CNN, and they, and they dutifully will uh, observe my comments and then also dutifully tell me how I did. And it, it's usually pretty good. And so I realized that I had been a week away, and I hadn't shaved, and I had some semblance of a beard on my face, and so I gave my, my parents a heads up uh, so that they wouldn't be shocked or surprised, and I can actually, sh this is undoctored, absolutely true, uh, this is the text exchange between my, my parents. 
What's up? My, my phone is usually not at 55%. I usually have to keep it charged. <laughs> That's the one thing that rings not true, but this is an actual text exchange. So I, I said, warning, I'm unshaven. <laughs> my, my mother, mom, responds first, and this is her response. <laughs> My son is always look handsome. Aw. Oh. I love you, Mom. Moms always make you feel good. Then, <laughs> this, was, this was the text from my dad. I could not... <laughs> You know, it's a podcast, so I have to say it. I have to say it. I could not listen what you are talking. Just watching your face. What happened? You didn't have time? Or you want to look like that? Thanks, Dad. You know, I don't know if you know this, but like 90% of men in India have facial hair. So I don't know exactly what was so terrible about that. <clears throat> if you're wondering um, where I got my self-confidence, it was from my mom. <laughs> if, you if you're wondering where I got uh, excruciating self-doubt, that was from my dad. But luckily, as I've written and I've, as I've said, it takes, it takes both qualities in the proper, perfect blend to allow you to be successful in life. So I appreciate both of your sentiments, but in defiance of my father, I'm, I may never shave this beard. <laughs> um, a, a lot has happened in the last year with the podcast. We had a birthday. We, we turned one year old, which is kind of cool. <laughs> There's been a lot of um, attention to the podcast. We have amazing guests every week. Lots and lots of people listen to it. Uh, we've been written up in various periodicals. So all of that has been gratifying. And the support, that, just you know, kidding aside, the fact that people in this room and many other people uh, take the time to listen, who care about it, um, who think that they're getting something out of it, uh, I really appreciate it. And it's been much more fun and much more gratifying to me because I learn as I listen to these guests also so I want to thank you all for your support. And so among the many milestones that I've experienced without subpoena power <laughs> while being a podcast host, you know, some things are outsized. Because uh, one day, a few weeks ago, this happened. With a knack for explaining complex legal issues with simple language, stay tuned with Preet. Preet being this ex-U.S. attorney. Jonathan. O M G. <laughs> the pod was a Jeopardy question. Now, when important things in my life have happened before professionally, I have gotten emails and texts from people. When we put a major terrorist away for life, one or two people would text me. Maybe. When I was mentioned in, on Jeopardy, my inbox was full. It's like, dude, <laughs> you're a Jeopardy question. But so let's, let's take stock of how fraught a moment this is. My main man, Jonathan, <laughs> my main man, Jonathan, is in the hole. <laughs> He's down $400. Someone else asked for that question. It's, it's a thousand dollar question. He can go from being in the red to being in the black with this one question. And I'm thinking, of, and there's a lot riding on this, right? For him, for honor and truth, <laughs> for me in the pocket. And I'm thinking, I really hope he knows. That. 
me. So let's see, um, let's see how he did. With a knack for explaining complex legal issues with simple language, stay tuned with Preet. Preet being this ex-U.S. attorney. Jonathan. Who is Barara? Good. Touchdown! Do you know how great that was? Not just, not just because he got the answer right, because he, but because he perfectly stuck the landing by saying my name perfectly. Barara. Great moment, I think, for America. <laughs> and you know what else is great? Jonathan Lau is in the house. He's so embarrassed right now. Jonathan, are you here? Can you just... There you go. Thank you, Jonathan. You complete me. So we have... So it's been fun. Um, we have more things coming up. So we have this live show. Since I'm editing less and writing less, we have two more live shows coming up. I expect to see you all there. We can take a bus or something, all of us, to DC on November 15th with Chuck Todd right after the midterms. And then we're going to the other coast, November 29th in Los Angeles with Kamel Nanjiani. Um, and a couple more things. These are not finalized yet, but uh, you know, one of the bits of feedback I get from the audience and the people listen to the podcast, which is very gratifying and flattering, is you want more. So we're thinking about ways, because once every Thursday, given what's going on in the news and in the world, is maybe not satisfying enough for people who you know, care what I say and care about my guests. So we're thinking about ways to bring more content uh, to all of you, uh, and maybe doing it in a way that doesn't require uh, advertising, although I loved reading those ads. So if you, if you, as you saw before, if you want to get updates and be the first to know what new, new things we're launching, which would be, I think, relatively soon, go to cafe.com slash preet, and you can get some information there. Um, I want to thank, by the way, all the people who made tonight and the podcast possible, including all the folks at Cafe uh, and at Pineapple Street Media. They're truly amazing folks. So I want to thank them. Now let's get to your questions. Dear Preet, these are all from you folks in the audience today. Um, some of your handwriting sucks. <laughs> Dear Preet, exclamation mark, love you, exclamation mark. If this show were last week, would the security have been so tight? Martha from Brooklyn, I got in fine. <laughs> and, and I look Middle Eastern, so I don't know in seriousness, um, no, it probably wouldn't have been. And so that's why we started a little bit late this evening. I know that uh, the fine folks at the theater and the NYPD and the JTTF and all the folks who keep us safe, who have been working around the clock, I can only imagine for the last few days because of these bomb mailings and further bomb threats. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna thank law enforcement for all they've been doing for the last number of days. Um, and, and thank all of you for going about, your, going about your business. I mean, New York is the greatest city in the world for a lot of reasons, even though it remains the biggest terrorist target in many ways. Uh, people are careful. If they see something, they say something, hopefully. That's how we you know, managed to find out that there was a problem with Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, back in 2010, because someone saw there was something going on with a car. So I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank law enforcement, thank security. Um, and hope that everyone remains safe. So that's the reason why it took a little longer to come in tonight. Second question, is this Trump cell phone thing a big deal from Catherine? <clears throat> so I, I presume what you're talking about is the report in the New York Times in the last couple of days by Maggie Haberman and someone else that describes how Donald Trump maintains a number of cell phones. I think he has a couple of government cell phones that have some of their capacities incapacitated 
but then he can't let go of a third cell phone that does not have the same protections, uh, and that basically, at will, the article says, that Donald Trump is being eavesdropped on by the Chinese in a way that allows them to understand who his friends are uh, and what kinds of arguments influence him. And so they can lead you know, sort of a simultaneous eavesdropping, spying, and also lobbying effort to get their points across. Uh, Trump himself, apparently, <laughs> in his vociferous, odd 280-character manner, uh, denied it and said, and so I think he said about this story that it was false <laughs> and also boring. <laughs> Which, you know, every once in a while, if a defense lawyer said, the allegations are boring, Not guilty. <laughs> it, did, I didn't, it, didn't, it didn't work that way usually. Maybe in the Eastern District of New York, we'll have to ask Jeff. <laughs> not, he didn't hear that. He's, he's backstage with headphones on. Um, look, I think it is a big deal, and it's a big deal for a lot of reasons. It's a big deal, number one, just in terms of the care that a president takes in guard, you know, safeguarding our secrets. It's a big deal because of the hypocrisy with which that same president makes comments and statements about other people up to and including you know, leading and embracing chance of lock her up about someone else who presumably had some security problem. Um, and when you're a president who has you know, sort of casually given classified information to visiting Russians in the White House and you don't take care to listen to the instructions of your closest aides, uh, who, by the way, if you trust the story and credit the story, which I do, have decided clearly that it's so outrageous and harmful, with a caveat, but so outrageous and harmful that they are leaking the story about the fact that their boss, the leader of the somewhat free world, uh, is cavalierly talking on a cell phone that can be intercepted easily by Russians and perhaps, uh, by Chinese and perhaps Russians also, that's a huge deal, uh, and it's a big problem. And the, the only sort of silver lining, if you read the article, which is both gratifying and also horrifying, is that his aides don't seem that concerned, or as concerned as they might be, because they feel like his knowledge and the depth of his expertise on some of these things <laughs> is so minimal and non-detail oriented. They're like, you know, like, how, much, how much are they really hearing? So I think, it's, I think it's horrifying, I think it's terrible, I think a message is being sent by folks in the administration, but it is not boring. <laughs> uh, next question, from Vince. Preet, who said the screen door slams? Okay, now you're insulting me. And it wasn't said, it was sung by Bruce Springsteen, and not only any song, first line of actually my favorite song, Thunder Road. That was not a thousand dollar question. Uh, next question. Dear Preet, when, if ever, do you see yourself returning to public service? Thank you. B. Kelly. Could be R. Kelly. <laughs> Is it R. Kelly? No, it's B. Kelly. Okay. I mean, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I love public service. I think public service is the finest thing you can do. I did it for 17 years. Say that again. So that's why I asked this question for like the three people from my high school who would, <laughs> who would, who would shout nice things. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I, 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 those of you who followed, who followed podcasts regularly, I, th I thought for a little bit about running for attorney general of the state. The timing wasn't right. The job didn't seem right at this moment. And even though I worked for a politician for a period of time, the senator from New York, and I think people should run for office, for me, I, I have a problem thinking about doing it the right way uh, with all the fundraising you have to do and the compromises you sometimes have to make. Um, so I had not ruled it out, but it wasn't right for me this year. I would think about it in the future, but I hope 
that these other things that I do are in some way public service, even as a private citizen. And most people here are private citizens, and there's lots that you can do to help your community, to help your state, to help your country. Um, I'm, I have this task force with Christy Ty Whitman about trying to advocate for ways we can strengthen our democracy, which is really important to me. I started another task force with a, with a number of prominent lawyers, judges, and academics to try to reform our insider trading laws um, that we'll propose to the, to the Securities and Exchange Commission and perhaps the Congress. And I hope that events like this and the podcast and other speaking out educates people, helps people understand their democracy, helps people to become active and activated about things that they care about and to make the country better. So I, I do like to think, and teaching, by the way, at NYU Law School, um, even being on CNN and explaining things so people are not as in the dark as they might be about complicated, arcane, legal, constitutional matters or political matters. So I like to think I'm continuing to do a public service. If there's an opportunity to do it in a more formal way, um, better in a non-elected position, um, I would consider it, but not in the immediate future. Thank you, R. Kelly. Uh, Dear Magic 8-Ball, will we survive if the midterms go red? Just thinking this is the longest two years ever. Yeah, we'll survive. I, I do have a worry. I don't want to be too negative. I, I'll just say this. Um, let's not worry about that until it happens, except to say worry about it enough to go vote. There's nothing more important, I think, than having a proper balance of power. And that's why I've had on the podcast from time to time people like Max Boot and Steve Schmidt and others who are still conservatives but who have left the Republican Party and who have been advocating. I think Bill Kristol has done the same. I think George Will has done the same. These are people that, that if you're my age, you've read them for years and years and years and often were infuriated by the ways they talked about policy because maybe you thought about things differently. And those people who infuriated progressives for a long time about what they thought about tax policy or even immigration policy uh, or national security policy are now saying that what we need the most in America is a check and a balance on what I believe also to be an out of control president. I don't know if he's a Republican or not, but I think it's out of control and it, and it bends towards authoritarianism in various ways. And if, you, if we don't see a change in the House or the Senate, then my worry is, not to be too depressing, my worry is that those few Republicans who don't like what the president does, who believe, who believe in decency over uh, partisanship, who believe in the country over partisanship, that they will be quieted even further. And they will say, well, there's nothing good in it for me and my future campaign prospects if I defy the president because look, everyone thought there was gonna be a blue wave, it didn't happen. So in some ways, it's more important from my perspective uh, that to avoid the negative, the spirit of which was in the question, to avoid the negative of having it look like there was a ratification of what this president has been doing and a supine Congress has been doing, then even the positive the benefits of, of better things that might happen if there's a, a, a change of power. So I think it's incredibly important. Will we survive? Yes, uh, but I don't like what it looks like on the other side of that. Last question, I know you try to play the reasonable level-headed guy, <laughs> but do you just rant when off air? <laughs> That's from Joanna, superfan. That's a great last name. <laughs> Is that your maiden name, superfan? Um, yes. <laughs> All the time. Tubin's like, when do I get to come out? <laughs> and the answer is, in a moment. <laughs> so you all, you, I'm sure you all know my guest, Jeffrey Tubin, who is as smart as they come, as articulate as they come, as well-versed in the law, in politics, and especially the Supreme Court as they come. He's a staff writer with The New Yorker. He's the chief legal analyst at CNN, which I think maybe means he's my boss. He's gonna have to work it out with my brother. Uh, he's a best-selling author. He's, he's written seven books. Uh, one of them, The Run of His Life, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, which is quite popular. 
uh, a book called The Nine about the Supreme Court. He's, he's working on an eighth book, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit, about the Mueller investigation. Seems premature, but I'll ask him about it. Uh, and he even won an Emmy Award in 2000 for his coverage of the Elian Gonzalez case. A true gentleman and a scholar, ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Tubin. Okay, so you talked about high school, and you talked about Bruce Springsteen, but you did not talk about your commencement address um, when uh, Bruce Springsteen's daughter was in the class. Why are you stealing the mic already? I didn't even, I didn't even ask a question yet. So tell them, tell them the story. We'll get to that in a minute. First, we had a whole discussion. Mm -hmm. I said to Jeff, just by way of FYI, I will not be wearing a tie. And he responded, this, he responded to my text, this is useful information. <laughs> Which it was. Which to me means he wasn't planning to wear a tie. And then when I told him I wasn't wearing one, the useful information was, I will wear one and show you up. Exactly. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, Before we get to my high school thing. Yes. No, I wanna, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Yeah. You're, it's your show. Apparently not. Um, the last two live shows I had, we had comedians, and we laughed, and I made, some, I made some jokes. It's a very serious time in the country. Uh, and all these people are here because they care about what's going on in the country, and I presume they listen to what, all the smart things you say on CNN and the smart things you write in The New Yorker and in your books. But my question, and, and bombs have been mailed to significant people in the country. Is it okay to laugh and have a sense of humor and have a good time? Say something hopeful or funny or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course it's okay to laugh. I mean, you know, there's, there's always been laughter. I mean, the Soviet Union was a much worse place to live than um, the United States is today. And, you know, jokes were an enormous part of life in the Soviet Union. I don't think we're near that yet, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, and also, you know, I mean, do you read the tweets? Just the capitalization is funny. <laughs> and, and, you know, that alone. So, you know, you gotta find joy where you can. And um, so, yeah, the answer is yes, you have permission to laugh. I, you know, it's funny you say that. You know, how, I, it, it's, it's interesting to understand how you're supposed to laugh about Donald Trump and I was gonna tell a, an anecdote that's, an, that's a metaphor that was used by Trevor Noah once I saw speak, and I'm only hesitating because my 13-year-old son is in the audience, but we can cut this out of the feed and he's heard a lot of stuff. <laughs> and Trevor Noah said it almost better than anyone I've, I've heard. He said, you gotta pick the things that you're angry about, and, but some of the stuff that's happening that Trump does is hilarious. The punctuation and many other things as well, and he says it's a little bit like there's an asteroid hurtling towards, this is Trevor Noah, not me. There's an asteroid hurtling towards Earth. And you know that it's gonna destroy our way of life. And the scientists are looking and they're saying, you know, we're not 100%, but boy, we're all gonna die. But the asteroid happens to be shaped like a penis. <laughs> so that's hilarious. But then you have to remember, it's about to destroy the Earth. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, and I'm with Trevor Noah on that. So, I'm, I'm, so... I'm picturing the asteroid, which is not good. Uh, but um, well, so this is the nighttime version. Uh, I see. Of stay tuned, yeah, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Um, but 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 should we should we always laugh given how serious it is? About oh, what Donald Trump yeah. Does. I mean, come on. And also, you know, you are you are a uh, new recruit to the news business, but you know, um, the, the news business thrives on black comedy, and you know, finding the uh, the, the um, you know the the 
the humor in the worst thing. It just reminds me, you know, I was a summer intern for, uh, for Carol Bellamy, who was president of the city council. People may remember there used to be a position called position, president of the city council. Anyway, I think it was, it was in between high school and um, high school and college. And I had to, <laughs> just to know how long ago this was, I had to deliver by hand a press release to the Daily News newsroom. And it just happened to be the day that Thurman Munson, the great Yankees catcher, died in a, uh, 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 I think it was plane a private, pl private plane crash. And I mean, the news had just come in and I happened to be standing in the newsroom when one guy you know, said to another, he said, hey, did you hear about Munson? He just got traded to the Angels. Oh. Uh, and I thought, that's like, I want to be in that business, you know? <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because that's a segue. Yeah. Not quite. <laughs> Good grief. I can't believe I remembered that, but it's true. Um, and then said it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we used to both work in places, U.S. attorney's offices, that were interesting in the following respect, right? Uh, I worked on organized crime cases, we had homicide cases, and you see the worst that humanity has to offer, right? You, you see evil in that job every day, and yet I've never been in a place, including comedic environments, where there is more laughter and, and more um, sense of humor, whether you laugh at other people's jokes or you like to tell jokes, than I experienced at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District, and I know the Eastern District was the same, so people maintained this ability, maybe they had to, in the face of, of brutality and, and bad conduct, to remain people with perspective and a sense of humor and also a sense of idealism. Do those things make sense? I, absolutely, and, and, but, but also just the, the human comedy and human tragedy that you would see in that office. I mean, I think it was a clue to my future profession that the parts of the job I liked most weren't necessarily like the catching bad guys part. I liked the sort of spectacle and the theater of it. And in fact, it just reminds me of one of the things I used to really like to do. We, we had a thing. I don't know if in the pretentious and self-important Southern District you had this, but we had something <laughs> called arraignment duty. You were listening where, backstage. Yeah, right? yeah, yes, I did. Right. Yeah. And the, um, it, where, where you just sort of got whatever cases came in and you did bail hearings for, for, for these people. And the, the pretrial services people would do background interviews about like, it wouldn't be about what they were, the crime they were arrested for, but just who they were. Like, you know, where they're from and what they, and I used to joke with the pretrial services people all the time because everybody arrested had the same two jobs. And guess what they were? They were either a security guard or a livery car driver. <laughs> and it just, I thought it was so bizarre and so interesting that like that pattern recurred. Now you could sort of figure out why that was the case, but that always struck me as sort of the kind of insight you would never get unless you actually had a job like that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. It, people are surprised to hear that there's a lot of joking that goes on in those serious places, but I agree with you. I think it's almost a necessity of the job that when you're doing work that's incredibly serious, you can't take yourself too seriously. Otherwise, not only do you not have a good time, not only is it a bad environment, not only is it a bad culture, but you don't have perspective on life. In jobs where you have to have perspective on life and proportionality, a sense of humor is essential. It's true, and, and also the, the, the other thing about you know, dealing with criminals on, on a day-to-day -day basis is one of the things you realize is how bad most of them are at their jobs. <laughs> and and, and not, not their real jobs, I'm talking about just their criminal jobs. And, and you know, in, you did white collar cases and you know, I, I did some white collar cases. One of the things you would always get in a defense argument was, you know, in, in summation to the jury, the, defend would all, the, the defense lawyer would always say, you know, of course he didn't in in endorse the check in his own name. That would have made him too easy to get caught, but they would always do stupid things. And, and, and so the idea that it was uh, easy to catch them, like, it's because they were simply bad at their work. And thank God. Thank God for that. Thank yes. God, right? And I think that leads me to think about two things. One is, 
that's a defense that sometimes this president's lawyers put forward and say, well, if he was really going to obstruct, would he have tweeted about it? Yeah, sometimes people do that. Well, I mean, you know, that, that's why, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I grew up as a, as a kid, you know, following Watergate. And Watergate was, you know, the, the, the formative um, news story of, of, of my youth. And I followed it, you know, I was a huge baseball fan and I followed it like I followed the Mets. And, you know, the, the great mystery of Watergate was like what was on the tapes? What what was what was Nixon really thinking? And ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing that um, you know that that, it, that the tapes had to be released. And then the smoking gun case, the, the tape, the June June twenty third, uh, uh, nineteen seventy two tape, where Nixon says, you know, tell the CIA to come up to tell the FBI to ease off on the investigation, you know, creates this fake cover story, the so-called smoking gun tape. Here, the president admits it to Lester Holt the next day <laughs> that, that, you know, he fired Comey, be, you know, because of the Russia thing. And, and, and I think, I mean, it has a very serious implication that even though, as far as I'm concerned, that was a confession, the fact that it was done in public and the fact that, you know, we've heard it for so long now, it sort of lost its sting, but it's still a confession. And, and, and I think that's what makes this, one of the many things that makes the Trump administration's misdeeds so, so peculiar in addition to so harrowing is that they don't even try to pretend they didn't happen. So I was going to get to the Trump stuff a little bit later, but since uh -huh. you say that, and you describe what he said to Lester Holt as a confession, is it your view that slam dunk case, Donald Trump obstructed justice? Well, look, the, oh. uh, no. I mean, uh, first, first of all, I mean, you have to talk about slam dunk, a case for what? I mean, you know... The, well, there, obstruction, let's start with obstruction. Well, but, I mean, I do believe that the Justice Department opinion is right that you cannot indict a sitting president. I think that's a correct view. So I don't think there will be any criminal case against Donald well, Trump. Is it a clearly impeachable case? Well, then, you know, once you start getting into a question of what's impeachable, that is much more a political question than a legal question. I mean, you, 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 you know, Gerald Ford, when he was in the House of Representatives, was involved in a fortunately stillborn attempt to impeach Justice William O. Douglas. But he said something very, you know, memorable about impeachment. He said an impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House of Representatives thinks it is. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I mean, the, the impeachment was designed as much as a political uh, check as a, um, as, a, as a legal check. So when you say, is that an impeachable offense, you know, would a Republican uh, House of Representatives um, it, it vote to impeach Clinton, uh, uh, Obama, uh, Clinton, Obama? Can you think I can remember who the president is? Yes, Trump, both of those. Um, on, uh, for that, of course not, because they wouldn't impeach him for anything. Would a Democratic House impeach him? Well, you know, I just did a piece on this in The New Yorker. Nancy Pelosi, Jerry Nadler, who will be the um, chairman of the Judiciary Committee if the Democrats retake, they are not going to push impeachment unless 67 senators are ready to vote to remove him, which is inconceivable. So, so and I'm sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but th no, I don't think that is impeachable or a crime that will be prosecuted, but I still think firing James Comey was an obstruction of justice by the president. So if he were a governor as opposed to a president, and you were the prosecutor, you would bring that case? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, I mean, there, there are interesting, ultimately resolvable, but interesting constitutional questions about um, whether, uh, you know, it is possible. Uh, you know, the, the, the law is clear that um, the president had the right to fire James Comey. He had the right to fire you. Your former professor, Alan Dershowitz, basically says that that fact alone, oh my God, he gets hissed. I know. He, I, it, that, that, how did you do in his class? Uh, I did well. Oh. Not great, but well. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But he, he basically argues, I think, and I think you think incorrectly, right. that the mere fact that someone has constitutional authority to do a thing means that engaging in that act can't be a crime, and that's clearly incorrect? I, I think it's clear. No, like just for example, as the example I have used in debating with him, is if, you know, Joe Smith walked into the president's office with a, with a you know, attache case full of cash and said, fire Preet Bharara and I'll give you this $10 million, and he did it, that would be a crime. Oh my God, is that what you think That's happened? what happened, that's what happened. I, I was saving it for my book, but now it's blown. <laughs> Can we take a step to the side for a moment uh -huh. to talk about what's been going on? And it's sort of related to this issue of, of criminals not being smart and how they go about it. And so these mail bombs, the last couple of days, and we both work uh -huh. uh, some of the time at CNN, and so what happened there and other places is, I think, very terrible. But immediately, you have started to see people, some in good faith, but m most, I think, for partisan or ideological reasons, state that, well, this is a hoax, this is being perpetrated, it's a red flag kind of thing, it's being perpetrated by liberals to change their narrative, and because it's so ineptly done and none of the bombs exploded. Rush Limbaugh apparently was saying this morning or yesterday morning, the fact that no one died and the fact that these bombs were sent to places where they were likely to be screened and they don't appear to have been expertly manufactured to his mind means that this is something perpetrated by folks to garner sympathy for the left. And they're using that same argument about ineptitude to suggest that. What do you make of those arguments? Well, I mean, it, it's just, you know, I, I guess, I mean, it's not surprising, but, you know, I, I take this personally. You know, I've worked at CNN since 2002, and, you know, I've worked at the Time Warner Center since it opened. And, you know, this was a bomb in our workplace. It was an actual bomb in our workplace. And, you know, I think if, if things had gone somewhat differently, there would be probably one of the workers in the mailroom who didn't have a hand or two. To, and, and, you know, that is such a chilling and disturbing thought. And, and you know, this is not you know, a, I mean, you know, th this is not people speaking inappropriately, this is not ugly racial invective, this, this is violent crime. And, you know, I don't know enough about um, explosives to know why these bombs didn't go off, but based on what I have heard from our colleagues and from, you know, just other news reports, these were not fake bombs, they were actual bombs. And fortunately, none, none of them have gone off. Um, I mean, just, it's, it's really amazing that they didn't. I mean, the Eric Holder bomb was not mailed from wherever it was mailed, and obviously this is all being, you know, investigated now, but they, they sent it to the wrong Eric Holder address, and so it went back, or it went to the Debbie Wasserman Schultz right. return address. So someone in her office could have been killed. I mean, it, it's just, it, it, I am deeply grateful that none of these bombs went off, but you know, the seriousness of this and the scariness of it is, it, I mean, is, is chilling. From a journalistic perspective, do you think, is it hard, because we have this experience all the time, right? There's a breaking story, you might be in the studio, other people, and what the anchors want to know is who you think did it, and when will they be caught, and what do you think the motive was? And I get that. But it's very difficult if those are the questions when you don't know. I mean, I get tired sometimes of telling Walt Blitzer, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I beat, that, that's beat why the hell you, out of That's me. why you're only the senior legal analyst, <laughs> and I'm the chief legal analyst. Okay, boss. Uh, how, how have your predictions worked out, Jeffrey? <laughs> so uh, it, it becomes, but there's this pressure to predict and to say, would it be, be maybe it's not possible because there's so many 24-hour cable news networks, for everyone on the left or the right, because they're all a little bit, not all, but the political folks are a little bit hoping that the narrative doesn't screw them, and a little bit hoping that maybe the narrative helps them. And I've seen some of whom are my friends. I have political friends on both sides who go on TV and, you know, not to be mean about it, but are bloviating excessively because we don't know. We don't know who did it. We don't know what the facts are. 
Is there a way in which we can have people just shut up for a little bit before predicting? Well, I mean, I, I always say that, you know, the, the three words you're never allowed to say on cable news are, I don't know. Oh, that's, uh, my contract is not uh, Yeah, that is, but, but um, it's, you know, there is, you know, there is a lot of speculation that goes on. And, and look, I try not to do it. I'm sure I, I do more than I should. But, I mean, even today, I, I noticed, um, I, I was on Situation Room before, before I came here, and... Uh, Wolf asked, I forgot one of my colleagues, <laughs> he said, why do you think the FBI isn't disclosing more information? And to me, it was just so obvious. It's like, because they're just investigating it. I mean, they are looking into what happened here. Now, the good news is, as far as I can tell, is whoever did this, the person or persons, left an abundance of clues. I mean, my God, there are, there are all these envelopes and they have fingerprints, presumably, or DNA on them and they have, you know, couriers. I mean, there's just, there's a lot to investigate. But, I mean, give them a day right, right. to, um, you know, chase this down. I don't really, and, and, and you know, look, I, I am as aggressive a reporter as anyone and we can talk about my abject failures to learn what Mueller's doing. <laughs> but um, the um, but but you know the notion that some things should be allowed to you know be investigated in in, in private is, is is a real one. Though I am sympathetic with the, with the journalistic urge to find out everything right away. So you had a great career as a prosecutor. It was then good. Just, okay. Yeah. Modesty is good. No, no. And then you became a journalist. How was that transition? I believe you once said um, that David Remnick caused you to change careers over the course of a weekend. Is that true? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, sort of. I, I mean, what, what happened was um, I had been in the U.S. Attorney's Office for, for three years, and I was sort of, th that is kind of the minimum stay. Uh, usually people stay longer. Uh, but I sort of thought, well, you know, it's time to see what's out there. And David Remnick, uh, at the time, was, had just left, or I don't even know if he'd started yet. He, I think he was on book leave from the Washington Post, writing his book, Lenin's Tomb. And uh, when I was working on the Iran-Contra investigation, he uh, was a close friend of mine, uh, of a friend of mine in Washington. We became friends in Washington. He moved to Moscow, moved back. David and his wife, Esther Fine, a reporter for the New York Times, my wife, Amy, who's here, uh, well, um, well um, we, we, be, we became friends. David um, was uh, one of Tina Brown's first hires at the, at the New Yorker. And I said, David, you know, what do you think? You know, what do you think? And, you know, I had done some freelancing. I had done a book about the Iran-Contra investigation. So I said, you know, do you think I could write something for the New Yorker? Well, David said... Well, you know, there's this new editor of the Talk of the Town section, Alexander Chancellor, and he's new to New York, and he doesn't know anybody, he doesn't know anything. Maybe he'll hire you as a Talk of the Town writer. <laughs> so, can I just offer a short story about Alexander Chancellor? Please. This is a story about how he didn't really know much about New York. He, he was subletting an apartment on, you know, like Fifth, Fifth Avenue in the 70s, and he used to walk down to Times Square near where our office was, and one day he, he came to the office and he said, you know, I think we should do a story. You know, if you go to, to 50th Street, there's this great big Christmas tree. <laughs> and it's like, we should do a story about that. And <laughs> oh, Alexander, we loved him. But um, anyway, because Alexander knew so little about New York, um, I, I, I faxed in, raise your hand if you remember what a fax is. Um, I faxed in my clips on like a Wednesday. I interviewed with him on Thursday. They called me and said, come talk to Tina Brown on Friday, and I had a new career on Monday. I mean, it's just, that's how, that's how it happened. Do you miss it, the other job? You know, the answer to that is a little, but, you know, being a grown-up means you have to make some choices. I mean, I love trying cases. I really, and, and when I, let's see, this, this is like when you know you're turned into an old fart when you begin sentences. When I was an, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, there were more trials. And one of the interesting things about 
the way the federal system in particular has evolved is trials have almost disappeared. And I was in AUSA for three years. I had, uh, I think, 11 trials, which was average. It was like not small, but it was not a lot. Today, you don't have 11 trials in a career for 10 years. And so I was really fortunate in that. I had a great time, but you know, I like what I do, so that's the choice I made. It's also been a long time, God, 25 years. Does it take, so you have a legal background and you talk about the law and write about the law. Some people don't. Uh, Nina Totenberg writes and speaks about the law and she doesn't. Is there some special trick, especially in, in the current moment, in explaining what goes on in legal cases and in constitutional crises and what goes on in the court that you rely on? Like, do you have principles of how you explain things to thoughtful people? You know, what I, what I often think about is the great value of having a legal background is you know what's not important. And you know what is, you know, conversely, you know what is important. I and mean, I often see my colleagues and, and, you know, my colleagues are every bit as intelligent as I am, but they don't have legal training. And I'll often see them with a document, like a complaint or an indictment. And they'll look at it and they'll hold it like, like, what, like, what is that? What, like, what is this? And like, what, what, <laughs> like, and, and if you have the background of having read and written indictments and complaints, you can tell what's important, and you know what's the boilerplate, and you know what's not boilerplate. And that, to me, is um, the, the, the sort of technical gift of what a legal background has done for yeah. me, is to be able to sort out what You what can separate yeah. the wheat from the chaff. Look, I'll give you another example that I'm reminded of when I first started doing this kind of thing. I got asked a lot of questions after the, the special counsel subpoenaed I don't know, I forgot who it was, but they issued a subpoena and everyone lost their minds. Right. This um, represents a deepening of the investigation, a widening of the investigation. What do you think it means? Of course he issued a subpoena <laughs> to this entity that's related to what they were already doing. It'd be shocking and malpractice if they hadn't issued the subpoena. But like you say, most people were celebrating what they thought was the deep importance of it because it was an actual action that they could report to their listeners or to their, to their readers when it didn't have a lot of significance. That's true, but you know there are moments when something may not seem as important as, and it really is, and, I, and, and the classic demonstration of that is the firing of James Comey. And you know, I, you know, I, I you know, the, the president, the, the cabinet serves at the president's you know, sufferance. You know, you can, the president can fire Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, tomorrow. And <laughs> do you I, want, if do you I want, know how to pander or if, what? If, you know, if you want more applause, I knew that was coming. Just go down the list of cabinets. Yeah, right yeah that's right. But but anyway, so so, so the president. But but you know, the FBI director has a term of ten years, and he can he or she can only be fired you know, for good cause. And, and you know, the, the whole purpose of the 10-year term, which, you know, by, ne by definition spans several presidencies, is to keep, um, you know, the, the FBI director at least somewhat insulated from politics. And, you know, one of the things I pride myself on at, at, you know, being in cable news all this time is that, like, I don't shout, I don't get hysterical, I'm not like a screamer like some people are on TV. But when, when Trump fired Comey uh, last year, I, you know, ramped up the outrage because it was outrageous. And that was even before he confessed to obstruction of justice. Um, it, I mean, just the notion that he would fire an FBI director out of peak, out of, you know, now we know, to, inter to um, obstruct an investigation of him, you know, it was outrageous then, it was outrageous now, I think it's illegal. And so, you know, there was an example, I think, of my legal background making something seem even more important than it might otherwise seem. Do you think that part of why you were so outraged was that one of the professed reasons given for the firing of Jim Comey was this 
memo that was prepared by the Deputy <laughs> Attorney General Rod Rosenstein that suggested that the President was firing Jim Comey not because of anything having to do with the Russia investigation, but rather for his mistreatment of Hillary Clinton, even though, <laughs> just to make it more softball, even though to this very day, Donald Trump um, warms to the crowd who chants, lock her up? Um, the, 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 it is true that the pretext offered was so transparently false that it did add to the outrageousness of it. Because, I mean, again, you know, again, one of the great things about being a journalist is, you know, the, the, the phrase, you can't make this shit up. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, the fact that Donald Trump claimed that he fired James Comey because he was too mean to Hillary Clinton, <laughs> given the way that campaign was conducted and given the way his rallies to this day continue that way. I mean, even I thought he didn't have the moxie to do that. Can we talk about Rod Rosenstein for a second? And a, yeah. a sort of a theory I have, maybe is totally false, that I've been thinking about lately, and I may have mentioned it on the podcast before, but I'm not sure. And, and it relates to what I also want to get into, which is Brett Kavanaugh. Wow. He's does, not does, even... Does... A, does, does does Rod Rosenstein like beer, too? <laughs> I like beer. I still like beer. Don't... F anyway, I'm sorry. We'll get to it. This is the night. It's a podcast. Version. I can say anything. No, it's all right. I have some questions about the Devil's Triangle, too, coming up. <laughs> I was thinking, uh, you know, you mentioned the, your yearbook. It's, I have a lightning round, literally. It's yeah, the lightning right. round. Oh, it's, it's, I, I, cause I, I hadn't thought. It's so weird during that whole... I didn't think of it. And, and just it made me think about my yearbook entry. Only could be condemned for extreme pretentiousness. <laughs> Uh, I, I, do, I don't... <laughs> I remember... Even I was, all right, go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll continue. Anyway. <laughs> so I, I know Rod for a long time, not you know, incredibly well, but we were colleagues in different offices and you know, spoke a lot of times and um, worked in parallel on some cases and fought about cases in full disclosure. So he does this thing, uh, and he's roundly criticized, not just in the press, but by his former colleagues, after having developed a reputation that clearly meticulously cultivated, because reputations are cultivated, I don't care who you are, how pure you are, people cultivate their, their reputations, of being sort of nonpartisan or bipartisan, served in you know, multiple administrations of different parties, and that he's a you know, lawyer's lawyer, a prosecutor's prosecutor, whatever other redundancy the possessive you want to use. And he found himself, um, you know, as part of a huge controversy, and his personal reputation and legacy were at stake. And then within days, it wasn't that long, where professionals who he had admired and who had admired him, I mean, I wrote an op-ed myself, which I tempered a little bit, the only op-ed I wrote during that time about the firing of Jim Comey and Rod Rosenstein's participation in it. And then what does he do? He's like, all right, so this is terrible, it's bad for me, it's bad for my reputation, it's bad for my legacy. Um, everything I thought about how I was perceived in the legal community, which is a community that people care about, is now shot to hell. Um, okay, what do I do about it? Mueller. How much does that factor in of you know, personal thinking about legacy and reputation and ego versus purely what the sort of lofty law requires? Um, it, you, you are so right uh, about that. I mean, I, I had some dealings with Rod Rosenstein very separately as, as a journalist. And, you know, he, he sort of looks like Clark Kent. And he kind of acts <laughs> like I Clark go that Kent. Far, right? um, I mean, he, he, th there is sort of an aggressive dweebiness about him. <laughs> but he is a savvy guy. And I think he, he, he got in over his head and, and that ridiculous memo about, you know, James Comey's misconduct to Hillary Clinton, I think, you know, in the reflection of a day, and, I, and, and you know, I think some of the, that story is still yet to be told, I hope by me. I'm not sure he even knew that was going to be released publicly. Right. 
So I, I think, you know, he was humiliated by this. And he then took revenge that will be historic because whatever else, I'm, I mean, I remember saying it at the time, if you were to go through the 330 million people in the United States and pick the single most damaging person you could have picked to be special counsel, Robert Mueller would have been number one. I mean, yeah. now it, it, it is, it, it, now there is a hypothesis or, or a scenario where that could rebound to, redound to Trump's benefit. Because if Mueller somehow comes up with something that is less than earth-shaking, the one thing you know, Trump's critics will not be able to say was, well, this was a whitewash because you know, Robert Mueller is nothing, is just like Ken Starr. You know, no one thinks that. I mean, this guy has the single best reputation of anyone in the American legal community. He did. He did, and I agree with that. Yeah. But it shows me that anyone in America can be swift-boated because true. you take Newt Gingrich, who on the day, Newt Gingrich, on the day that Mueller was appointed, in this famous tweet he sent, um, said, oh, everyone, basically, I'm paraphrasing, everyone can relax. Bob Mueller has a great reputation. Uh, until it became politically expedient to both, uh, you know, put off Democratic demands for various things and also to ingratiate yourself with the sitting president, which lots of people like to do, Newt Gingrich began to sing a different tune. And to me, at least, one of the most depressing things about all of this is the degree to which no one's perfect and you don't put anyone on a pedestal and Bob Mueller included. Um, although, you know, he's a pretty impressive guy and, and a patriotic guy and a courageous guy and was loved by all sides before this especially fraught investigation that he didn't have to do um, after already having proven himself through a lifetime of courage and service and selfless service. How depressed are you about how easily, for political purposes, people will just assassinate the character of people who don't deserve that kind of character assassination? Well, you know, that, I don't know if I'm depressed, mm -hmm. but I'm, I am, I mean, I, I think I'm realistic about what this political moment is. And, and you know, one of the things that, you know, we, 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 we do this at CNN is like, well, what do you think the impact of, you know, this, this Trump debacle is? You know, his press conference with Putin at, at, uh, in Helsinki. Um, you know, locking up those kids in cages at, uh, you know, at the, at the border. Uh, you know, name, name your scandal. Everything winds up the same, 60-40 against. Every poll, no matter what it is, is roughly 60, 55, 60% of the people disapprove of Trump, 35% to 40% approve. And basically what happened was Mueller started off somewhat differently, more favorably, but it's just retreated to the mean. Brett Kavanaugh started off somewhat differently once the whole, you know, the, the, the hearings happened, it, it retreated to the mean. Every single issue that involving Donald Trump, it, you know, the, the poll numbers turn out to be the same. That, that is just an, and, and, and you know, it's just an illustration of the incredible tribalism of this moment where everybody on your side sees things one way and everybody on the other side see, sees things the other way. Do you ever look at what's going on in the country? I know you're a little bit further removed from actual practice of law than I am, but so maybe this is my uh, you know, prism. But I look at what's going on and the way arguments are made in the public, and I think to myself, how do, you, how do they get away with it? You know, I feel like we've had people talk about the death of expertise, there's also the death of evidence, the death of truth, that in the, in the environs in which we used to travel, if you lied and lied repeatedly and demonstrably, if you used arguments that were about race or about fear um, or that didn't make any sense or that were self-contradictory, you got thrown out of court and the people who were in the position to make the decisions, whether it's a magistrate judge, a judge, a jury, an arbitrator even, those arguments and those tactics didn't prevail. And I'm not, na I'm not naive enough to say, well, you know, the, the court of public opinion is the same as a federal courthouse. I know it's not. But do you ever think about it from that perspective? Like, well, how is it so easy to lie this way and to cheat 
I don't mean cheat about money, but to cheat about truth and to cheat and be corrupt about argument and common sense, and there's no price. Let's discuss your distinguished predecessor, Rudy Giuliani. I did, just did a big profile of him, <laughs> and, you know, he's exhibit A of the phenomenon you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, look, Rudy didn't rise to the heights of being U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, but he was an important prosecutor. <laughs> And, I, you know, don't mess with me on that subject, okay? I didn't say anything. Um, the, um, but, you know, he was, you know, he was controversial, but he was a very serious U.S. attorney. I mean, and they did some very important cases, and he was very effective. And someone who, and, you know, as mayor of New York, sure, he was controversial, but, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, things accomplished during, during his mayoralty. Now... You know, him ranting on TV about how the FBI are a bunch of thugs and, and just, you know, getting his facts all wrong. Storm, and stormtroopers. Stormtroopers, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, such, it, it's such an, it, it's a human illustration of the phenomenon you're talking about how, you know, the, the partisanship um, has degraded um, his, you know, his stature so much, but... He's still got that 40% who thinks he's great. And, and if I can just add one, one point to that, is that, you know, and this is where I think you and I disagree somewhat, is, is that, you know, this is not a both sides do it phenomenon. This is something that has happened on the right, that the disrespect for truth on the right, political right, is different. And, and you know, this I, don't, is coming, I, don't disagree, I don't disagree with Well, that. but this has come up, you know, in, in the context of, of these bombings. And, you know, there was this, you know, congressman from Utah who was on bef before me on sit room, and he was saying, you know, what I really need, you know, what we really need to do is tone down the rhetoric on both sides. You know, we need to sort of dial it back. You're, and, and that's bullshit, because the, it's not, it's not, it's not Bernie Sanders who is saying, you know, it's okay to beat up journalists and that's funny and, and it's not Bernie Sanders, you know, and I'm mentioning Bernie Sanders because remember that crazed supporter of Bernie Sanders shot Steve Scalise and that was a terrible thing. But you could, no way you could say that Bernie Sanders encouraged that. But you listen to the way Trump talks about, you know, his opponents, they're evil, they're enemies of the people. And, and uh, you know, and that's, that is a different kind of rhetoric. You know, do I know for sure or that, that he, you know, inspired these bombs? No, I don't. But the recklessness and the dishonesty is, is different and it's all on his side. And, and, and I'll say that in front of any audience in Manhattan of li all liberals, and I don't care. That shows the kind of courage I have. Maybe even L.A. All right. That's right. So, so Certain you have parts this, of Boston. Uh, this is another segue. I'm mastering the segue in this podcasting life. So you're writing a book about some of these topics, and you and I have you know, run into each other and I've asked you. I think it's a very daunting thing to write a book generally, mm -hmm. as I've just discovered. <laughs> but to be asked to write a book about events that A, are mostly submerged, i.e. what the Mueller investigation is about, and I, what I, in, by an, an institution that I think is very, very tight-lipped, and then also that changes day to day. So I know you're not that far into it, but I'd like to know how you even go about doing that book, and is it orders of magnitude more difficult and daunting than the other books you've done that have been backward looking? Well, it's, you know, actually, um, first of all, it is very daunting because this is the most buttoned up organization I have ever seen, in, in, particularly in Washington. I mean, you know, Supreme Court justices will actually talk to you. <laughs> Nobody in the Mueller office will even talk to you. I mean, they, 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 I mean, you know, I know some of those people yeah. as you as you That's do. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, the the directive went out. We don't talk for the record. We don't talk off the record. We don't have coffee. We don't have drinks. We don't talk to journalists at all. 
And that is without precedent in, in, my, in my experience. Now, can we, can we pause on that sure. for a second? Yeah. How do you feel about that as a citizen, as a journalist, as a former prosecutor? Um, I, I feel, uh, well, I have different feelings about it as all three of those things. I mean, I, I, I think it is, I mean, the, you know, one of the things as a, as a journalist, and look, I wrote a proof profile of pre, and, and so, you know, we dealt with this very issue with each other. I think um, when there is an active investigation going on, um, it is understandable for a, a prosecutor to say absolutely nothing, and I, and, and I respect that. Um, once um, a case has been brought and the trial concluded, then I think that you could talk about some things. And, and you know, when I wrote about you, the insider trading cases were mostly over, uh, the Skelos and the, the, the Silver cases were, were over. So, so, I mean, th there were stuff you could talk about, but there were, I, I, I didn't, pres you know, I didn't even ask you about pending investigations because I knew you, you couldn't really talk about that. So I think Mueller, you know, for example, could talk about the Manafort case. Which, which is over now. But they have decided to take um, the, the completely opposite task. This is frustrating to me on a day-to-day -day basis, but again, now putting on my cynical journalist book writer hat, it's actually better for me because the Mueller story now is almost completely unknown. Who are these people? What do they do? How did they investigate? No one knows. People will read a book about that. Right, <laughs> you know, uh, and all these guys will. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, you know, I am going to take my time. I mean, I, I am. I, I, look, I got nothing to write now. Nobody's talking to me. Uh, but you know, just journalistically, what yeah. you do is, you know, there are a lot of defense attorneys who are involved. You talk to them about their dealings with the office. You talk to witnesses about what their lives are. So, so you can sort of report around which gives you a good background, but it's not the meat of the story. Let's jump to the Supreme Court. Okay. Did Brett Kavanaugh lie in his confirmation hearings? Um, I, it's a very opinionated. You know, I, I don't, I, I mean, if, if I had, you know, based on the evidence that I have seen, probably. Um, as with Clarence Thomas, you know, 27 years ago, um, I don't really think I mean, I think the the scandal of the Kavanaugh nomination or the, the, the significance of it is really in the first part of the hearings, not the second part. It is that when you see what Brett Kavanaugh stands for and how he will vote as a justice, you know, what he did or did not do in high school is certainly significant and I think is disqualifying in and of itself, but you know, if you want to talk about the Supreme Court as an institution and the, and, and the decisions that will come out of the court, which ultimately is what, why the court matters, that's the real peril to me of the Kavanaugh nomination, not, you know, the fact that he, you know, has bad behavior in his background. Right. I mean, that's fair. My question about the future is this, because you invoked Clarence Thomas just now, who had difficult confirmation hearing. A lot of people have very strong views about him. I do. And you wrote something interesting. You said, this is way back, early in his tenure, you wrote, the Tom, uh, Justice Thomas's jurisprudence seems guided to an unusual degree by raw anger. And that anger emanated from the difficult time he had getting uh, confirmed and the allegations made against him. And as we all saw, um, as Matt Damon has... Uh, <laughs> has exemplified a lot of raw anger in that second portion of the hearing where he made accusations against Democrats in particular, where he talked back to senators in a way that even he thought momentarily he had to apologize. Just, just for one of the senators. For one he of talked the back. Now, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Amy Klobuchar, no apology to Sheldon Whitehouse. Correct. Just for those who are keeping track. But um, the, my question is, and obviously it's impossible to know, do you think that he is going to be influenced by his anger as you perceive Thomas was for years going forward? Probably, probably, but he's so conservative and so determined to push that agenda, it'll probably be hard to tell because he would have voted the same way anyway. The Delta is not that big. 
the delta is not that big. Yeah. No, I really, I really don't. I, I don't. I don't think so. And it would probably only surface in certain circumstances, in certain cases. But um, I, I suspect it's there. Was there any particular line of questioning by any particular senator during the, the second hearing that involved Dr. Ford in the morning and, and Kavanaugh in the afternoon that struck you? Um, you know, w one of the things about congressional hearings, and, and you know, Preet was, uh, you know, work, worked for Chuck Schumer on the Judiciary Committee, so you're, you're very familiar with this. It is, it is, you know, senators talk, they don't ask. You know, they really just don't know how to ask questions very well. I mean, that's not why they're hired to do what they do. And it's sort of frustrating. You know, one of my favorite statistics from Congress, you know, when, when John Roberts was nominated to be Chief Justice, Joe Biden was the chairman of the, or the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee. And, you know, they had 30 minutes to ask questions. Biden talked for 23 of the 30 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. That's how senators ask questions usually. Um, you know, I, I, but to answer your question, not particularly. Did someone jump out at well, you? I was going to ask. Yeah, you it sounds like you had something in I, mind. I did, and you mentioned Sheldon Whitehouse a minute ago, yeah. which is what put it in my mind. There was that exchange between Senator Whitehouse, who, to his credit, um, became a senator by way of being United States Attorney and Attorney General, so he has some prosecutorial chops. And he got into this exchange that made you cringe on one hand because it was about his high school yearbook, but on the other hand made you think, whoa, what's going on here? And Sheldon Whitehouse, to me, and maybe I'm in a minority here, when Sheldon Whitehouse, just as a pure sort of observational matter as a, as a lawyer and a prosecutor, he asked uh, Brett Kavanaugh the question, you know, what, what's the devil's triangle? And he sort of asked it in a way, to me at least, you might ask your child who you suspect has done something bad and who will lie to you and has not been smart enough about having a higher order lie. So, you know, where were, where were you? And they're like, I was at Joey's house. Who else was there? And he's like, oh shit, I didn't, I didn't come up with that. <laughs> what did you guys do? Like, because you and I know, right? And a lot of lawyers, uh. simply asking questions and detail quickly explodes lies. And, and I don't know the truth, but I have a suspicion. And Sheldon Weiner said, and again, it seems unseemly, it's from high school, and it's the, what Urban Dictionary says is unfortunate. Rom, you don't, my son doesn't need to know what Urban Dictionary is. Yeah, don't, don't look at Urban Dictionary. And he says, next time, in fact, you should probably stay home and do your homework. <laughs> and he says, what's the devil's triangle? And Brett Kavanaugh looks, looks him dead in the eye. It's a card game. And then Sheldon Whitehouse says, how's it played? And I remember thinking, I mean, you tell me what you think, that this was a gambit that ended up not kind of fizzling out, but had it succeeded in the way it might with your child, who was not destined for the Supreme Court, <laughs> it would have been the most explosive thing in the hearing. And so I've heard these people say, well, why are you asking about the yearbook? But I understand the mindset. You have to be thinking, this, this guy is lying about that, and it's a stupid lie, and it's in some ways a frivolous lie, but it's endemic of what this person is about, and then he asked the question, and Brett Kavanaugh looks right back at him. There's three cups, and you put them in a triangle. And then, I'm like, holy cow. And then, Sheldon Whitehouse says, okay, what else? So he's going you know, to the next levels, and we've all seen in court that unravel the witness very quickly. Brett Kavanaugh is like, you familiar with, he, he responds with a question, which is, are you familiar with quarters? Without answering in great detail, but suggesting without saying so, that it's some weird game that no one in the world has ever heard of <laughs> with three cups and you throw quarters into the cups. And at some point, at that point, I guess Sheldon Whitehouse being you know, an experienced cross-examiner realized, you know, I'm not gonna get anywhere with this guy because he is such a liar. I don't know if this was what he was thinking, but that's what I was thinking watching him. So I found that extraordinary. Well, that, well you know, and the other thing about, I remember that exchange and the thing that was so maddening about the whole second chapter, the, the, the Dr. Ford and response testimony, was that the senators only had 10 minutes. And even good prosecutors can't do much with 10 minutes. Plus, Kavanaugh knew how to filibuster. And you, know, you can answer any question with two or three minutes. 
you know, Senator, let me put that in context. Oh God, you know that that that's you know, and <laughs> yeah. that that you know eats up the time. So I mean, it, as a fact-finding enterprise, yeah. that was destined to be and set up to be a standoff. Yeah. I mean, that's true of every congressional inquiry, and I led one myself. Right. There, there are multiple things, but the two things I think that cause you never to be able to get to finality or a conclusion or depending on your perspective, truth is A, what you just said, uh, the time limits, because the luxury you have in court is, you know, dude, you can, you can filibuster for an hour, for right. two, but I'm, gonna, I'm coming back tomorrow, I'm asking the same question again, I'm gonna do it again, and I have no cameras, and I don't have to worry about the public, I don't have to say I am Spartacus, I don't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, Corey's not here, is he? Yeah. I don't have to do any of that stuff, and the second thing, he is here, and the second thing is that there's no arbiter, right? You have a chairman, but you have no judge, like Judge Ellis or Judge Mukasey or Judge Rakoff or whoever, who can say to one side, you know what, that's not proper. Stop that. So all sorts of impropriety happens on, on, on every side. You never get to well, the and, and there's no one to say, answer the question. Right. I mean, you know, a, a judge ultimately, if, if a witness tries to filibuster in response to, to a question in a courtroom, you know, the judge, you know, they usually try to stay a certain degree of neutral, but, but ultimately a judge says, no, you have to answer the question. And there, no one serves, no, no one does that purpose. We're, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you one more Supreme Court question. Okay. And then the lightning round. You said, um, sort of in a, in a dramatic way, you made a prediction about how long Roe v. Wade would be the law of the land. What was that prediction? 18 months. Do you stand by that? Yep. There's a case coming now, which is the first. The, the, the Indiana law, um, Indiana passed a law that said women can no longer have abortions for sex selection or a or, or, or something. It's basically it's like you know a, a list of reasons you can't have an abortion. Seventh Circuit struck it down as unconstitutional. That's going to be the first case that they get. They will uphold that law, and then. You know, the, the senators, uh, the, the state representatives, they follow the news too. And South Dakota, Mississippi, Alabama, they're all just going to ban abortion and dare the courts to overturn it. And, you know, people try to sound sophisticated and they say, well, you know, John Roberts, he's going to want to do it slowly. They're going to limit Roe v. Wade, but they're not going to overturn Roe v. Wade. If you have a state that bans abortion outright, you can't overturn that law and you, you can't uphold that law and, and leave Roe v. Wade in, in, intact. And, you know, during the campaign, Donald Trump said repeatedly, I will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. And what I think he meant by that was, he will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will overturn <laughs> Roe v. Wade. And I think that's what he's done. Yeah. And, and you know, elections have consequences. They do. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end on that in a minute about how important elections are. Quick lightning round. These are yes okay. no. They're mostly easy. All right. Well. Have you ever been body slammed? <laughs> no. Nope. I I I uh, I, want, I wrote my first sports column. For the Harvard Crimson, um, I had a I had a column in called this, Inner Tubin. Yeah. It was a good column. It was a, it was a good name. <laughs> Often the best uh, the best part of the column was the name, but um, I, I I tried out. For, it was sort of like a George Plimpton thing. I tried out for the Harvard Boxing Club, so I was knocked down, but I was not body slammed. Have you ever body slammed someone else? I, no. I, I, have you ever played? Devil's Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, Brett Kavanaugh and I are roughly the, the same age. I'm a little older. Um, but as I, as I went through his, uh, his um, yearbook entry, I, I guess I led a more sheltered life than I thought because <laughs> I didn't know what the hell he was talking about during a lot of that. Will, will Roger Stone be indicted? You know, that's really uh, an interesting question. I don't like to brag, but I'm kind of the Boswell of Roger Stone. Um, I, I, did, um, I did a profile of Roger Stone in The New Yorker 
which, um, which opened in a sex club in Miami, which, which he claimed that he met the hooker um, where, who, who turned in Elliot Spitzer. And uh, just parenthetically, it was the single best expense report I ever turned into the New Yorker. <laughs> And, 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 you know, the, the, the proprietor of, of the sex club, you know, the New Yorker's fact checkers are very famous. And uh, they called this guy to fact check some of the stories and he didn't want to be in the story. And he called me up and said, you know, I don't, we don't want to be in the story. And if you write about our club, I'm going to say publicly that you were in the sex club. I said, what do you mean, pal? It's the lead of the story that I was there. So um, I didn't do anything untoward. I just watched Roger. Uh, but um, no, Roger is a fascinating figure for many reasons because, you know, in most, most of life, in, in, in law enforcement, in journalism, people tend to underplay the bad things they've done and overplay the good things they've done, Roger is the opposite. Roger like right. pretends he did more bad stuff than he's actually done. So it's very hard to know sort of where he fits during all of this. It, it, but, so but, he, so but, I will but remind anyway, the witness that this is a lightning round. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Would you like to hear so, about my So is he gonna be indicted? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I think not, actually. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll, was, we'll, that was a little thunder as well as lightning. Yeah. Will you, <laughs> will you be, will you be replacing Megyn Kelly? Will I be replacing Megyn Kelly? Um, I, I guess my knowledge that blackface is actually like a bad thing um, would qualify me, but no, I will not be replacing her. Uh, in in the following Texas cage match, Dershowitz versus Giuliani. Jeffrey Tubin puts his money on um, Rudy. Rudy, oh. yeah, yeah. Ru Rudy's, uh, you know, uh, he's like he's a tougher guy. Final question. Yes. Has anyone ever finished a New Yorker article? <laughs> like. This, I write 7,000 words about this guy. And I couldn't twat. finish it. And this, he couldn't even. Even my dad. Yeah, even, it might have been yeah. because of the beard. He's like, it's, this it's, is it's very too long. Too <laughs> I love you, son, but it's just too long. <laughs> are, are you going to sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star now? I'm not going to, no. Gosh, I tell you these things. I know, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we got we to wrap up. I have a couple of final words, but before I do that, everyone, big round of applause for Jeffrey Tubin. Just very quickly, uh, I, I end the live podcast in the same way I do the regular podcast to talk about something I think is important. Um, you know, our being here, as I said at the beginning of the show, is a significant thing. Where we are, the town hall is a significant place. In some ways, you could say this is hallowed ground in terms of civic engagement, uh, because this, this theater was founded by a group of suffragists, the League for Political Education. And what they were looking for was a place to gather people together and educate them, hence the name of the place, the town hall. As I mentioned, it was built in 1921 with democratic principles in mind. Um, the idea was that there were no you know, box seats or obstructed views. In theory, what led to the phrase, not a bad seat in the house, and I hope that that has been true. Uh, and while this bu building was being constructed, the 19th, 19th Amendment passed and women gained the right to vote, and it became a symbol of the movement. So voting has always been important. Not everyone has always had the right to vote. Back in the time I was referring to, women didn't have the right to vote. People who do have the right to vote are not exercising it enough, and as we discussed, it's really, really important. It's never been more important. There are other whole categories of people who don't have the rights that I, virtually all of you, I guess, have. Um, and a group of people that Jeffrey and I know well, people who have been incarcerated in prison. And I've mentioned this on the show a few times. There are people who, after they pay their debts to society and they try to rehabilitate and come back into society, they still are not permitted to vote, which to my mind makes no sense and is a form of injustice that makes, you know, should make your blood boil.
In Florida, there is a ballot measure that's a ballot measure that people can vote on to amend a section of the Constitution that would, that would re-enfranchise people who have been incarcerated. And it would be, I think, 1.5 million people are not able to vote in Florida. It would be one of the greatest re-enfranchisements of groups, I think, since the Civil Rights Act uh, in the 60s. So this is all just to emphasize and to reiterate, because I'm a redundant lawyer guy. <laughs> Voting is important. If you have the right to vote, please use it. If you know someone in Florida or have influence in Florida, get people to vote for this so everyone has a chance to vote and decide the future of their country. There's nothing more important. Thank you. I love you. God bless you all.